We'll now focus on personal protective equipment, commonly known as PPE. This presentation is based on information found in Chapter 6 of the National Pesticide Applicator Certification Core Manual. Let's begin with a simple question. What's the purpose of PPE? The purpose of personal protective equipment is to help pesticide handlers reduce the risk of exposure to pesticides during handling tasks such as mixing, loading, applying, or repairing or cleaning pesticide application equipment. PPE requirements are found in the precautionary statements section, one of the first sections of the label. So what's the minimum PPE you must wear? This might seem like a trick question, but it really isn't. The minimum PPE is that which is listed on the label for the task you're performing. Also important to note, if you're working with two pesticides at the same time, such as when tank mixing, compare the labels. Wear the items on the labels that offer the most protection. For example, if one label says to wear shoes and socks, and the other product label says to wear chemical resistant footwear, then you must wear the chemical resistant footwear. The type of PPE required to wear when handling pesticides will depend on several factors. One, the toxicity of the pesticide, danger, warning, or caution. Two, the handling task and dilution. Will you be working with it in its concentrated form while mixing and loading? And are there different PPE requirements when applying the pesticide, performing early entry worker tasks, or cleaning application equipment? Three, the pesticide formulation. Are you working with a dust or fine mist, which could be easily inhaled and might require respiratory protection? Is it a liquid that has the potential to splash in your eyes when pouring requiring eye protection? All these questions are important and the label language sorts it out for you and makes it easier to determine what you need to wear when handling the product. You must read the entire label to make sure you're using the right PPE at the right time. There might be variation. This is a good example of a label requiring the handler to wear protective eyewear when working with the pesticide in its concentrated form, but not once the pesticide is diluted. Unfortunately, the order of the paragraphs is odd. A person usually works with a pesticide in its concentrated form before it's diluted. Handlers could easily overlook the fact that they need to wear protective eyewear when mixing or loading. Here's another good example of the importance of reading the entire PPE section of the label to make sure you wear the correct PPE for the task and area. Notice the different respiratory protection when working in enclosed areas versus outdoors. The label also states that handlers who will clean or repair application equipment must wear chemical resistant footwear and a chemical resistant apron in addition to a long sleeve shirt, long pants, chemical resistant gloves, protective eyewear, and respiratory protection required when applying the product. There's a difference between protective clothing and personal protective equipment. The label might list long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes, and socks. These items are referred to as protective clothing. Employers are not required to provide employees with protective clothing, but several operations such as golf courses and landscape companies do. Many also provide laundering services. This makes it really convenient and safer for employees and their family members. PPE, on the other hand, includes additional items including eyewear, respiratory protection, gloves, coveralls, overhead protection, footwear, and aprons. You might notice certain types of PPE materials listed on the labels, such as a particular glove material, nitrile, barrier laminate, etc or indication you need to make sure you wear waterproof or chemical resistant boots. When it comes to determining the difference between waterproof and chemical resistant PPE items, the definitions are very straightforward. Waterproof items are made of material that allows no measurable movement of water or aqueous solution through the material during use. Chemical resistant PPE items are made of material that allows no measurable movement of the pesticide being used through the material during use. The label might require chemical resistant gloves, overhead protection, footwear or boots, and coveralls or a rain suit, but sometimes this label language is overlooked by handlers. 
It can also be hard for handlers to determine if the coveralls provided at work are chemical resistant, especially if they're not the person who ordered the PPE for the operation. There are many different types of chemical resistant materials, including butyl and nitrile rubber, PVC plastic, and non-woven coated fabrics. Due to the different toxicities and formulations of products on the market, different labels require different levels of protection. Expanding a bit on chemical resistant PPE, some labels will include chemical resistant aprons on the list of required PPE during mixing and loading tasks or when cleaning the application equipment. This is to protect handlers and their clothing from pesticide splashes, spills, and splashback droplets when hosing off equipment. As you can see in this photo, the man is wearing an apron extending from his chest to his knees. This is great for those tasks just mentioned. However, the apron strings or the looser ends at the base of the apron could very easily get caught in moving machinery parts and result in injury. Therefore, never wear an apron when working around machinery. Gloves significantly reduce dermal exposure that can occur when pouring, mixing, and applying pesticides. As explained in the study guide, research has shown that handlers mixing pesticides received 85% of the total exposure on their hands and 13% on their forearms. However, you can't just wear any glove. You must read the label, choose the correct glove, and concentrate on the material and thickness. It's very important you don't wear leather, suede, cotton, or cotton line gloves when working with pesticides unless instructed to do so on the label. These materials absorb chemicals. Note that some pesticides, such as fumigants, will require cotton gloves as the gas formed by the pesticide can get trapped underneath nitrile or rubber gloves and burn the handler's skin. If you ever have a question about the PPE required on the label, you can always call the pesticide manufacturer for clarification. The answer to the million dollar question, which of the glove materials offers the best protection against all eight different types of solvents? It's the barrier laminate material of the silver glove. Question. When you think about the name of the material barrier laminate, it makes sense. What does barrier mean? What about the word laminate? As you'll see here on the EPA's chemical resistant glove chart, barrier laminate is highly protective and will be listed on the label as a glove that can be worn. The good news is the EPA's label standards only allow for the listing of gloves that offer the highest protection against the product, so you don't have to memorize anything or wonder if one glove is going to protect you more than another. If a glove type is listed on the label, it's already been proven to provide a high amount of protection against the solvent in the container. For example, on this table you'll notice solvent category A is for dry and water-based solvents. All of these gloves offer high or sufficient protection. All will be listed as options on the label. Compare it to solvent category G. Only barrier laminate and Viton gloves offer a high level of protection. Those are the only two types of gloves that will be listed on the label. Just to clarify what I meant by solvents, here's a table from the EPA's label review manual. No need to memorize this, it's just for clarification purposes. If gloves are listed on the label, you must also wear them when you repair, clean, or adjust application equipment. Some organic pesticides and products people perceive as green or natural can be skin irritants and might also require gloves. No matter what type of pesticide you're using, if gloves are listed on the label, then you must wear them when handling the product. This is a very common question. Should I wear my gloves out over my shirt sleeves or my sleeves over my gloves? To make it simple, think of the way any pesticide liquid might trickle down your glove when spraying overhead. You want the glove on the outside so any pesticide would end up outside your sleeve and not flow inside your sleeve and contaminate your arm, if that makes sense. When spraying toward the ground, you can pull your sleeve out over your glove. People often have the same question about their pant legs. They wonder if they should wear their pant leg over footwear or tuck their pants into their boots. As you see in this photo, the handler's wearing their pant leg over their boot. 
which will prevent pesticides from entering their boots, contaminating their socks, and eventually their skin. Since we're on the subject of footwear, make sure you're wearing footwear that you're willing to wash at the end of the handling task. Some people work with pesticides that require them to wear shoes and socks. They're following the label instructions if they wear a closed toe shoe. However, if they have leather shoes they aren't willing to wash, they run the risk of contaminating their hands when they remove them, the inside of their vehicle if they don't remove them before driving from the treatment site, and potentially tracking pesticides into their home if they wear the same work shoes home. A better solution is a rubber boot, as most people don't hesitate to wash their rubber boots when they're cleaning gloves, eyewear, and other PPE. There are pesticide handlers who work in rough terrain, such as forests or canyon areas, who struggle to get the proper footing and stability when wearing rubber boots. The EPA allows them to substitute with a leather boot that has the proper sole for rough terrain areas. However, they will need to think about the potential risk for exposure to pesticide residues on their leather boots and ways to reduce the risk of contamination. As you saw in several photos throughout this presentation, there are different types of coveralls and protective suits. There's one-piece zip-up coveralls of woven fabric. You've seen both the white coveralls, which people often refer to as Tyvek, and the blue disposable coveralls shown as well. In the previous slide about footwear, the pant leg appeared to be part of a suit made of either a waterproof or a chemical-resistant rubber material. Sometimes you'll see those sold as a two-piece set with a separate pant or overall type of suit, plus a zip-up jacket like the one on this slide. It also appears as if this jacket has a hood for overhead protection should he need it. It's really important to wear the coveralls and suits as intended so you're protected. The sleeves are designed to be worn on arms, not tied around the waist like a belt. Zippers are supposed to be zipped. Disposable coveralls are to be disposed of even if they haven't been used but tore the moment you put them on. Some pesticide handlers find they're much taller or broader than the coveralls they're provided. Communication with the employer is important. Let the employer know if you need a bigger size so you can protect yourself from the pesticides you're using. Unfortunately, the go-to head protection for pesticide handlers tends to be their favorite baseball cap, which can absorb pesticides when spraying overhead. Worse yet, people rarely think to wash baseball caps with soak of water, hang them up to dry, or store them at the work site. Instead, they return with the same hat on their head and wear it again and again until they find a new favorite baseball cap. If a pesticide requires chemical resistant headgear for overhead protection, a good solution would be the type shown on the man in this slide. It has a wide brim, it's made of chemical resistant material, and it's easy to clean. As you saw in previous slides, there's also chemical resistant suits and coveralls with built-in hoods. Here we have several different types of eye protection, goggles, face shield, safety glasses, and full face respirator. Protect your eyes when mixing concentrates, handling dust, or spraying whenever you're working with a pesticide that requires eye protection. If the label allows you to wear safety glasses, make sure they have both side and brow protection. Many people need to wear eyeglasses to read the labels and see what they're doing. Some people have found goggles that fit nicely over their glasses, but it really depends on the size and style of frames of the eyeglasses. Some people wear a face shield over their glasses. The good news is there are also prescription and reader safety glasses and goggles you can order online. They might be a little pricey, but definitely worth the investment for your safety. As will be mentioned multiple times throughout this course, always read and follow label instructions. Some products and their formulations have the potential to enter the eyes easily and cause damage. If you remember during the labels presentation, we reviewed a chart displaying the different signal words. It showed the acute toxicity concerns of each. Those pesticides that carried the signal word danger on the label without the skull and crossbones were classified as highly toxic category class one due to their corrosive properties. One of the concerns was their potential to cause irreversible eye damage. Therefore, the label of these products most likely will require eye protection that completely protects the eye from spray droplets, such as a pair of tight fitting goggles. In addition, 
formulations and equipment producing fine droplets as what happened during air blast applications, or if you have the potential to become exposed to pesticide mist, fog, aerosols, or dust. In these situations, you want to make sure your goggles fit snug to your face and don't have side vents where pesticides could potentially enter. This is a nice segue into respiratory protection because those same types of pesticide formulations might have the potential to enter the lungs if you aren't wearing the proper respiratory protection or are wearing a label required respirator but using it incorrectly. In 2015, the EPA adopted OSHA's respirator regulations for agricultural operations. I'll highlight a few of those requirements in the next few slides. Not everyone will work with a pesticide that requires respiratory protection. In fact, many employers are selecting pesticides that don't require respirators over those that do, when they're able to find an equally effective alternative. Often the cost, the time commitment, and concerns for their employees' health is what drives this decision. This will become clear as we cover the respiratory protection program requirements in the next few slides. The very first thing you must do before working with a pesticide that requires a respirator is to complete a medical evaluation with a health professional. A medical evaluation begins with completing a medical monitoring form. This is a questionnaire about your health. It helps you to determine if it's safe for you to wear a respirator and is an extremely important first step. Some health conditions may become worse with the use of a respirator, for example, asthma or claustrophobia. So it's important to be honest when answering these questions. Not all pesticides require handlers to wear respirators and therefore it will not impact your employment if it's discovered wearing a respirator would be detrimental to your health. Respirator packaging has instructions on how to make sure the respirator fits, seals, and how to clean and maintain it. However, respirator training is equally important and required. Handlers who will be working with pesticides that require respiratory protection must go through respirator use training. The training must include instructions on how to read the label to get details about the type of cartridges, filters, and etc. to use. Respirator filters and cartridges are listed using an NIOSH number. NIOSH stands for the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Applicators using tight fitting respirators must have a fit test to make sure they're using a respirator model and size that fits properly to their face. These fit tests must be done each year and there's a record keeping requirement. Powered air respirators are much more expensive, but they do not require the annual fit test. I'll touch on different types of respirators now. As I mentioned, if you'll work with a pesticide requiring respiratory protection, you will go through much more detailed training, but I wanted to at least highlight the different types you might see. There are atmosphere providing respirators for situations in which the air in the atmosphere is so hazardous, you need a respirator that will provide you with uncontaminated air to breathe while you work in the area. One scenario could be when treating an enclosed area with phosphide fumigants. This photo shows a self-contained breathing apparatus. You can see the tank of oxygen on the equipment. It looks very much like scuba gear, which is the same concept for times when a person is underwater. These are air purifying respirators. They protect the wearer by filtering out and purifying the surrounding air. Both half face and full face respirators are shown here. Powered air purifying, or PAPR, is not shown. You might also use a gas mask with canisters for some pesticide applications, and different types of filters, cartridges, and canisters for different formulations could be used. There were a few different letters and numbers mentioned describing the respirator requirements. This will help you decipher what they mean. TC equals testing and certification. HE equals high efficiency. R series filters are oil resistant. N series filters are not oil resistant, and P series filters are oil proof. The numbers following N, P, or R represent the percentage of efficiency for filtering particulates. 95 equals moderate filtering efficiency, 95%. 99 equals high filtering efficiency, 
and 100 equals the highest filtering efficiency, 100%. For example, we hear a lot about N95 respirators with COVID-19. These are not resistant to oil and provide moderate filtering efficiency, 95%. There are some commonly asked questions about filters, cartridges, and canisters. What type do I use? Is there a difference and or does it make a difference? And how often do I change them? The label and the respirator packaging will both provide guidance to make sure you're using the correct respiratory protection, including when you need to use a filter, cartridge, or a canister. There is a difference. Also keep in mind PPE requirements on a label might be updated due to changes to the formulation, regulations, NIOSH coding system, or the discovery of a new health concern. Consult pesticide and respiratory equipment manufacturers for the most up-to-date information. The respirator manufacturers also provide guidance on cleaning, maintaining, inspecting, repairing, and replacing respirator parts. These instructions must be followed so the equipment continues to protect the user from exposure to pesticides. For years, the general rule was if there weren't specific instructions, filters should be removed at the end of the handling task when the handler is cleaning the respirator. They should also be removed the moment the handler can taste or smell the pesticide, indicating either the filter is damaged or the respirator is not sealing to the user's face. Unfortunately, now we have a new concern. Following instructions to change filters or cartridges the moment you can taste or smell the pesticide might be difficult for some who have lost their sense of taste or smell due to COVID. Hopefully, respirator medical evaluation forms will soon include questions about a person's ability to taste or smell so it can be determined whether or not the person could safely work with a pesticide requiring respiratory protection. Look around at the people sitting next to you. Do you all have the same shaped head? Most likely you don't. The two men in this photo are father and son, and yet one man has a longer shaped face than the other man. Each person who plans to work with a pesticide requiring a respirator must have their own respirator that fits their own face. This was a greater concern before the pandemic. I think people have moved away from sharing PPE due to concerns of contracting viruses. You might think you're trying to protect the other person by lending them a respirator. However, if the respirator doesn't fit, there could be gaps that would allow pesticide vapors to seep in, which could be as dangerous as not wearing a respirator at all. It's equally important to make sure your own respirator fits your face and forms a tight seal each time before you use it. Your face shape or size might have changed slightly due to age, dental work, or weight change. All could impact the way a respirator fits your face and its ability to protect you from pesticide exposure. The following two short video clips are interesting because they show the important steps to making sure your respirator fits you correctly and forms a tight seal around your face each time before you use it. Your respirator packaging will contain guidance on how to make sure you get the proper fit and seal. The following video is just a sample of guidance provided by a company called 3M for their half face piece respirator 6000 series. Instructions are specific for that type of respirator, but I like the video because it demonstrates how the procedures can vary from one type of filter to another. Before we watch this clip, I just want to reiterate this is only a sample and is specific to the respirator, filters, and cartridges shown in this video. However, it is a great video to watch because it shows different methods. Always consult the instructions sent with the respirator you're going to be using. User Seal Check Always check the seal of the respirator to your face before entering a contaminated area. Before you enter any contaminated area, you must perform either a positive or negative pressure user seal check. To perform a positive pressure user seal check, place the palm of your hand gently over the exhalation valve cover, being careful not to apply too much pressure and disturb the face seal. Exhale gently. If the face piece bulges slightly and you feel no air leaking between your face and the face seal, your respirator has sealed properly to your face. To perform a negative pressure user seal check with cartridges, First, cover the open area of the cartridge with the palms of your hands. 
Filter retainers may aid in conducting a negative pressure user seal check. To perform a negative pressure user seal check with the round 2000 or 2200 series particulate filters, position your thumbs over the center of the filters to restrict airflow through the filter. To perform a negative pressure user seal check with the rectangular 7000 series particulate filters, squeeze to compress the filter. After you've sealed the filter or cartridge inlet, inhale gently. If the face piece collapses slightly and you feel no air leaking between your face and the face seal, your respirator has sealed properly to your face. If you detect air leakage when conducting either the positive or negative pressure user seal checks, reposition the respirator on your face or readjust the tension of the straps. Then repeat the user seal checks. If you have any difficulty getting the respirator to fit, review the user instructions in the packaging or the fitting instructions provided by 3M to be sure you're putting it on correctly. If your respirator still doesn't fit correctly, see your supervisor. A user seal check must be performed every time you put on your respirator. Never enter a contaminated area if your respirator does not seal properly. Remember, a user seal check is not a substitute for a fit test. It's very important that you have a fit test to be sure the respirator is capable of fitting you properly. Your respirator may be damaged if you smell or taste contaminants, if breathing becomes difficult, or if dizziness, irritation, or other distress occurs, and you should leave the contaminated area immediately, see your supervisor, and repair or replace your respirator. Remember, a user seal check is not a substitute for a fit test. It is very important that you are fit tested annually to be sure the respirator is capable of fitting you properly. This next video clip is also eye-opening. Often employers buy a pack of 10 masks and they assume since the masks have elastic straps that one size will fit all. You'll see in this video prepared by the Ag Health and Safety Alliance that handlers might have to select a different brand, shape, or style of respirator. I really like this video because it identifies something that probably happens often. An employer purchases a box of 10 respirators like the type shown in the video and assumes it's a one-size-fits-all situation, or they don't realize this type of respirator must also form a tight seal around your face. Hi, I'm Carolyn Sheridan from the Ag Health and Safety Alliance. We're going to talk about the importance of getting a respirator that fits you correctly. First thing that you need to do is to make sure you know your hazards and select the correct respirator. But once you do that, we're going to talk about the importance of a user seal check or a fit check. That should not be confused with what's called a fit test. A fit test is where we add an agent or a test agent when you have the respirator on and then we can detect whether you're able to smell or taste or there's any particles that get behind that respirator. A fit check or a user seal check is something different. That's something that you personally do every time you put on your respirator. Also know that the manufacturers include instructions that talk to you about how to put the mask on correctly, how to take it off correctly, and how to do a user seal check. So Kelsey is with us and she's going to put on her respirator correctly and we're going to show her how to do a user seal check. So Kelsey, the first thing you're going to do is cup this respirator in your hand like that, just like you have it, and then you're going to put your chin in the bottom of the respirator and then place it on your, on your um, face. And then that top strap is going to go up on the top or the cradle of your head. There you go. And then you go ahead and keep a hold of that respirator and take the bottom strap and put it down around your neck, underneath your hair. So if you have long hair, make sure it's underneath your ponytail, as Kelsey's doing. And then we want to make sure to remind you not to pinch that respirator. Very important. We want even pressure. She's taking two fingers on either side, gentle pressure down. And then the next thing we're going to do is the user seal check. So we're going to say you need to cover the most of the substance as possible on that respirator. And you need to exhale sharply and then inhale. And then while you're doing that, Kelsey, I want to know if you feel any leakage around your respirator anywhere. 
There's air coming out in the bottom. So if we turn your head to the side, what we can see is that Kelsey probably has a little bit of leakage here. The respirator looks like it's a little too big. We would, of course, recommend that she maybe adjust the top strap, the bottom strap to make certain, and then she would do the inhaling and exhaling again to make sure this is not fitting her. There's alternative shape respirators. There's things that are smaller. Um, we also have ones that look like this. So we might have to try a variety of respirators to make sure we can get something that fits Kelsey. Because the most important thing in understanding how to protect yourself, know your exposures, and then find a respirator that fits you and do a user seal check every time you wear that respirator. This is a really fun visual produced by the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. As you noticed in the previous video, the respirator did not fit the woman's face. There were gaps that would allow pesticide vapors to enter. The same thing could happen if someone had a mustache or beard covering the area where the respirator needed to form a seal. If you look at this illustration, you'll see green check marks and red X marks underneath the different facial hairstyles. The green checks indicate those styles that are less likely to interfere with the area where the respirator needs to seal to the face. If you look closely at those with the red X marks, you can see those mustache and beard styles would definitely break the seal. There are other respirator options, which you can learn about by reviewing the resources available on the web page mentioned earlier, pesticideresources.org slash WPS slash respirators.html. Some employers and handlers decide to select pesticides that don't have respirator protection requirements, which is also another option. Now we'll talk about cleaning PPE after pesticide handling tasks. It's often the handler who inspects the PPE before each use and cleans the items at the end of the handling activity. However, it's the employer's responsibility to provide and pay for all the PPE listed on the label, to make sure employees are trained on the proper use and care of PPE and that they follow the instructions provided. Maintain all PPE and ensure it's inspected for cracks, tears, holes, weak spots, or damage before each day of use. Properly discard and replace any damaged and disposable PPE. Provide instructions to handlers on the proper way to clean, dry, and store reusable PPE and provide a place away from pesticide storage areas for handlers to put on, remove, and store PPE. Note that the lockers shown in the picture appear to be inside the pesticide storage area, but it's deceptive. The pesticides are actually stored in locked cages in a separate area away from the PPE lockers at this site. When returning home, change out of your work clothes and separate them from other clothes. Remember to keep all your work clothing out of the reach of children and pets. Interestingly, the National Pesticide Applicator Certification Core Study Manual has many more steps than you'd probably consider. They are, while outside, shake any dry material from cuffs and pockets, then hang to air out. Wash work clothes separately from other laundry. Load a few items at a time into the washer so there's plenty of agitation and water to wash items thoroughly. Use hot water at a high water level. Although new washing machines might not let you do this, some machines automatically adjust the water level for the size of the load. Pre-rinse clothing. Use a heavy duty detergent when you're ready to wash them. Set the machine for the longest wash cycle, running at least two cycles for lightly or moderately contaminated clothes. Discard heavily contaminated clothes, as these can't be cleaned effectively, especially if a woven fabric was heavily contaminated with undiluted pesticide or a large quantity of diluted pesticide. Line dry outside. Run an empty cycle through the washer to clean it of any possible residues. Provide the same instructions to people who launder work clothing for you. Let them know the clothing was used while working with pesticides and provide them instructions on how they can protect themselves from exposure to the pesticide residues. 
Think about the items you tend to wear or carry with you when handling pesticides. Most likely, each item has the potential to become contaminated with pesticides. Contaminated items that people forget or don't want to wash are jackets, eyeglasses, leather boots, baseball caps, and cell phones. Wear items listed on the label that you're willing to wash after the pesticide handling task. Now we'll view the last two minutes of this video about the 12 steps for cleaning PPE. It's an entertaining and informative video. The link has also been provided on the slide for anyone who would like to view it again or share it with other pesticide handlers. pants. Someday when you're covered in pesticide residue and yelling for help, I'm sure you'll be begging for the 12-step program. Are we clear, Mr. Perfection? Brick, during the decontamination process, I noticed you mentioned some decontamination supplies. What items are needed and who provides them? Now that's an excellent question, Beth. These are the decontamination items people need to have on hand. A flat surface, Plenty of water, soap, a brush with a long handle, a sponge to wash goggles and respirator, single-use towels, one-gallon Ziploc bags to store respirator, goggles, and gloves. Your employer usually makes these supplies available. Now back to you, Beth, and Mr. Fancy Pants. Jerk. Thanks, Brick, for that in-depth report. To summarize, here's Brick's 12-step program. Yes, Beth, here is Brick's 12-step program. 1. Rinse PPE. 2. Use dirty gloves to remove dirty hood or hat. 3. Use dirty gloves to remove dirty goggles. 4. Use dirty gloves to remove dirty respirator. 5. Use dirty gloves to unbutton dirty outside jacket. Then wash gloves and jacket sleeves to remove jacket grabbing it from clean parts. 6. Remove your protective pants using clean gloves to touch clean parts of pants. 7. Wear clean eyewear. Start washing PPE. 8. Wash respirator. 9. Wash your protective suit. 10. Wash your boots. 11. Remove and wash goggles. 12. Wash your gloves. When you're done, move to a clean area to change into your regular shoes. Now back to our regular programming.